Scripture for the message is Luke 11, verses 14 through 26. Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. Now when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I do cast them out by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has reached you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted, and he divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through wasteless places, seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my home from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. And it then goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. The kingdom of God has reached you. When Jesus said those words, I think there was a stirring in people's hearts. Not the stirring of uh, amazement that was there at his miracles, but a stirring that kind of starts to think, sins can actually be forgiven me. God's love can win out in, in my life, even in my life. In the world, there's so many judgments about who is worthy or deserving of God's blessing, and especially who is not worthy. And we've all felt like we've been on that side of the equation at times. Yet through all of the noise and oppression of those various judgments of us, Jesus' voice resounds. The kingdom of God has reached you. This is what our text lifts up for us today. Is Jesus heals a man who was mute, he couldn't speak, and the crowds are amazed. But some in the crowd, as we don't know particularly who, they said he could only do this if he was controlled by evil himself and that evil was allowing him to do these miracles. Now, if you're like me, that uh, claim sounds bizarre at first sight to think Jesus is going to heal people uh, by the power of evil instead of by the power of God. But we have to remember the judgments that occurred back in that day and time in which Jesus walked on the earth. Illnesses and handicaps back then were considered to be curses that God handed out to people who were particularly deserving of having such punishments in their lives. This is the way they thought back then. That person has this condition because they were such an extreme sinner. Now the some, and especially probably the leaders, believe that since they themselves didn't have those conditions, they weren't mute or blind or lame, and they didn't have long-term illnesses, they saw that as God blessing them in their attempts at being good by their own power. So when Jesus heals this mute man, I think that they're thinking, this isn't supposed to happen. That man doesn't deserve to be able to have the ability to speak. God was just when he made him mute in the first place. And so who is this rabbi who's subverting God's judgment? He must be evil. 
Now you think, why would they care so much whether some particular man who couldn't speak could now speak? Well, that same judgment that said he's this strong sinner who deserves to be unable to speak, those same judgments also said, but I am a pretty good person, and I deserve God's blessing. And so if you call into question the judgment on the mute man, you're calling into question the judgments they had about themselves. They were good and deserving or worthy of God's blessings. So Jesus responds to all this by asking, first of all, how could evil destroy evil? As if basically that would be nonsensical. Evil isn't good, and so it can't do something good. It can only do evil. Only good overcomes evil. And he uses both the example of a kingdom and a household to say if a kingdom or a household is divided against itself, they're fighting amongst themselves, they will not stand very long. And so evil can't be fighting against itself. But he says, if I do these things, these miracles, by the finger of God, indeed the kingdom of God has reached you. And then he uses another quick comparison of a strong man who's in his palace and he can uh, keep everything in the palace safe as long as he's there until someone stronger than him comes in, overpowers him, and then takes whatever he wants out of that palace. And he's comparing the devil, the evil one, to the strong man who seems to be in control of people's lives, like this mute man, and yet Jesus overcomes him. He overpowers him, and so therefore he's able to take away the spoils. He says in this example he can take anything out of the devil's house, what seemed to be in the devil's power. So the devil's claim upon this mute man has been taken away. Then Jesus adds some odd words about an unclean spirit going out of someone and bringing back uh, seven more spirits. Again, this sounds very strange, but I think this is addressed to those some people who thought Jesus only did things by evil and thought that they deserved God's blessing. Whenever those kind of people think that they've made themselves good, they fix some problem in their life whether it's a financial problem or a health problem or, or a relationship problem, whatever it is, they think they've made themselves better and that God is going to bless them for making themselves better. But Jesus said if someone actually does that spiritually, they're actually worse. They look better outwardly, but inwardly they're worse. They fix their relationship problem. They have more money. They have better health outwardly. But inwardly, they're attributing all that to themselves. I fixed my life. I made myself better. To have that attitude means not only to have the original problem you had, but to have seven worse problems, Jesus says in this example of the unclean spirit bringing seven more in. To be good means to trust in and rely upon God. But these people, by their very definition, they think, I've fixed my own life. So why can't these other people do it? They're just bad sinners for not being able to do that. And Jesus is saying they're the ones that are lost in the evil because they thought they could make themselves good. Outwardly, they fix their problems but inwardly they're spiritually worse. So Jesus seems to be saying in this whole passage, it's, uh, he comes, he does good, they are not uh, working with him, so they're against him. He who does not gather with me scatters. Goodness is not evil. Jesus came to bring goodness. So, the kingdom of God has reached you, he says. There is forgiveness of sins. God does overcome evil in our lives. Trust in him, not in ourselves. And he will deliver us. Let's hear an example from William Eastburn. He experienced a sign of Jesus' deliverance. He said, I've always been a type A person. 
being focused and perhaps a bit compulsive, but it helped me build a good law practice. When his secretary one day said that people saw him as forbidding and driven, he countered, well, maybe, but that's one way to get a lot done. He felt he carved his own life out with his wife Connie and their five kids. That life included church and attending a weekly Bible study, but a life that had especially a successful law practice. He had clients in several states. He made tough decisions for his clients. They were based on efficiency and control, what seemed to do the job the quickest and the best. Well, all of that changed one morning. As he drove him to work and got out of his car, William noticed another car had pulled in behind him. He looked at the driver. It was a young woman that he had briefly represented a few months before. She turned out to be mentally unstable. I had convinced her, her father to have her committed to a mental institution. Well, now she had brought a gun and she was going to solve all her problems. When are you going to do something about my health? She screamed at him. Mary, don't you remember? You fired me. And before he had time to react, a bullet ripped through his jacket near his shoulder and it lodged into a wall behind him. She assumed the gunman's stance of the spread legs and the hands on it and he had time just to think everything was in slow motion of just lifting up his briefcase in front of him. A bullet uh, slammed through it and thudded into his chest. A crimson ringed uh, hole was near his heart. He thought to himself, this is it. I'm dead. My chest was on fire, he said, as if a vice were squeezing his lungs. My legs collapsed as if there were no bones in them. His partners rushed out of the building to him as the woman drove off. He told them her identity so the police would know, and then he said, tell Connie I love her. Then William began to pray silently. God, I, I have no control of this. I'm in your hands. Take over my life. Your will be done. Instantly, he said, his fear and anxiety had vanished. The pain even stopped. I was wrapped in a feeling of total peace. He stayed conscious, and when the medics arrived, they thought he was in shock, but he had experienced shock early in his life, and he knew he wasn't in that. He said, I just felt God's presence. At first, William thought he was just being given a few extra moments by God that would be lucid, so maybe he could tell his wife uh, goodbye. It was a peace that I felt, born of God. I never felt so complete, so at peace, so loved. He was helicoptered to a large hospital. The bullet had caused two broken ribs. It nicked and bruised his heart, and it punctured one of his lungs. Though he was only given a 40% chance of surviving the surgery, his recovery was fast and complete. So that now every day, he said, when he goes to work, William looks up at that bullet hole in the wall from that first shot that had missed him. For me, it's a daily reminder of the ongoing miracle of God's love. He said he was still a type A person, but now I look on everyone I encounter as true gifts from God not just making quick judgments about them, but learning from them, finding out their concerns, their needs. I even feel sympathy for the woman who shot me. I pray that she would find the peace that I found on that day. There's so many judgments in the world around us about who is deserving or worthy of God's blessings and especially who is not worthy. Yet through all the noise and oppression of those judgments, Jesus' voice still resounds today. The kingdom of God has reached you. For 
forgiveness of sins is still possible. God's love and goodness does overthrow evil. The kingdom of God has reached you.